Hi everyone, this is part three of chapter three's lecture. So when we left off, we were covering topics uh, around and about cell junctions, which was sort of our jumping off point for talking about uh, the plasma membrane. So this PowerPoint will finish chapter three and we will discuss the membrane, what's in it, what's on it. And also uh, at the end of the PowerPoint, we'll sort of start to discuss how things can cross the membrane as well. So let's get started, shall we? The plasma membrane consists of a phospholipid bilayer, and you guys already know that because we've already dis already discussed phospholipids. And sorry about that, I'm just turning down the volume on what I'm listening to so I can talk better. I like to sit and listen to jazz or ambient music while I make these, so that's what's up with that. Anywho, let me grab my pen here and get... Mm, it's almost Halloween. Let's use this spooky pumpkin color. Okay, so we've got phospholipids. And remember, these have a hydrophilic head. Hydrophilic heads so that they can face both the aqueous solution outside of the cell and the aqueous solution of the cytosol. Um, and then this inner region, this is hydrophobic. So that creates some rules about membrane crossing that we'll address later. In this picture, you can also see some other elements. So there is a fair amount of cholesterol in this membrane and cholesterol can be used to stabilize or stiffen or change the fluidity of a given membrane. And so different cells are gonna have varying amounts of cholesterol in their membrane according to what their membrane needs are. Uh, there are proteins also here represented in green, and these are going to be either peripheral or integral. So a peripheral protein means it's on the membrane, but on one or the other side of it. So this would qualify as a peripheral protein. An integral protein means that the protein sticks into the membrane or even goes all the way through. So this one and this one and this one I would call integral. We also see the glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx we'll get into more in a little bit. Uh, but basically the principle behind the glycocalyx is that the membrane of a cell is not just sort of a flat field of phospholipids. It's got a lot of stuff sticking off of it, and one of those things is the glycocalyx, which consists of uh, carbohydrates combined with fats or lipids to give the cell some identity. Oopsie. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned we would get into some rules about how things can cross the membrane. So if this part is water loving, that's great because that means we can make a bilayer out of this. But notice that the part of the phospholipid that is hydrophobic is much longer. And if you put two phospholipid layers together, you get a bilayer, which means that this hydrophobic zone in the middle here is really, really thick. So the presence of unsaturated fatty acids in a phospholipid gives the bilayer a fluid structure. So it's more like oil than it is like solid fat. And that's good because that gives cells the flexibility that they need. So the hydrophobic intersection regulates what can pass through passively. So passively here means without spending ATP. So notice here we have two molecules, this one and this one, and these are trying to cross the membrane, but they're being turned away. Now, why is that? Well, it's because these are polar or hydrophilic. So if the heads of the phospholipids are polar and these things are polar, why can't they cross the membrane? What's the problem? Well, Remember that hydrophilic and hydrophobic things don't mix, except for in this special molecule over here. So when this polar molecule tries to go through the membrane, it gets turned away by the phospholipid bilayer's hydrophobic section, so it kind of bounces off. Now, the opposite is true for nonpolar or hydrophobic uh, substances. So things that are nonpolar or hydrophobic, these can cross the membrane without any assistance at all because they are attracted to the hydrophobic 
middle of the bilayer, but they can't stay there because there's no room. So they squish on through with very little problem. So those are some really basic rules about membrane crossing and how that works. All right, so cholesterol. So this is a patching material. So if the cell uh, has a place where the membrane has lost some phospholipids for some reason, it can fill that in either temporarily or permanently with cholesterol. And it also helps to maintain optimal fluidity of the phospholipid tails. So get rid of that, do this. So optimal fluidity means the optimal oil-like state. So it helps keep the membrane nice and fluid so that things can move around within the membrane. All right, so proteins come in integral or peripheral, as we discussed, and these are going to be serving various purposes. So they can either be anchors. So you can see, for example, this one here, this peripheral protein is going to be anchoring the cell membrane to these, what are probably intermediate filaments. Other proteins have different functions. So these integrins are holding on to the glycocalyx, and then maybe there's some channel proteins or some other stuff going on there. All right, so different kinds of proteins. Uh, we just saw a couple different kinds, but we want to address some other kinds as well. So one kind that we need to address are uh, recognition proteins. So these are things like uh, receptors or recognition modules on white blood cells. So basically these proteins are going to sit in the membrane and they're going to bind to something. Uh, what the something is varies widely, so we can't really make generalizations about that, but it's going to bind to and recognize a thing. Signaling proteins are involved in taking a signal that is outside of the cell and not bringing the signaling molecule into the cell. So notice these little purple eye-shaped guys are not going into the cell at all, but rather they're binding to this protein and then the protein is transmitting that it's being bound to into the cell. So it's saying, hey, little purple eye things are binding to me and that means something to the cell. Usually it means something that changes the cell's metabolism in some way. So uh, that's the mechanism of action for many hormones. Many hormones don't actually ever go into the cells that they're affecting. They just bind to the outside and then the protein transmits the message into the cell. Of course, proteins can also be used for transport. So if you want to transport something that is large or polar or both across the membrane, remember, uh, let's say that these are glucose just for the sake of argument because they're already hexagons. So glucose is both of those things. It's both large and it's polar. So if this tried to cross the membrane here, it would just get bounced off and can't go. But if we have a big, huge tunnel for it created by a tunnel shaped protein, then you can allow glucose to cross the membrane in either direction in this case. So those are channel or transport proteins. So now we're going to get into some stuff that's hanging off of the cell membrane, meaning it is embedded in the cell membrane, as you can see here, but it is hanging off the outside. So before we do this slide, I'm actually going to skip ahead to the next slide and explain some stuff about the glycocalyx, and then we'll come back once I've explained that to you and explain uh, how HIV takes advantage of the glycocalyx to gain entry to helper T cells. So for now, let's just go like this. Okay, so the glycocalyx, this is carbohydrates with lipids or proteins. So glyco means sugar, so that implies carbohydrates. And then within the glycocalyx, you have two kinds of things. You have glycoproteins and glycolipids. So these are just combinations of carbs with lipids and or proteins, and they're primarily used for signaling, but also for other stuff like uh, sticking to things. So here we have the lumen of a very small blood vessel. So you can see 
an endothelial cell here. This is the cell's nucleus, and then here's the cell's membrane reaching around here. So if I were to ask you on the lab practical uh, what kind of epithelium this was, you would say simple squamous, right? Because it's a single layer of thin, flat cells. So this is probably a small blood vessel, um, for example, a capillary. So they have a very, very thin, uncomplicated membrane uh, that makes up their wall. It's usually just a couple squamous epithelial cells. Um, and you can see that it's not a smooth inner surface here. So there's lots of these little hairs. It looks like the lumen is furry. These are the glycolipids and glycoproteins of the glycocalyx. So if we zoom in on this transmission electron micrograph, we can see numerous hairs. So in this case, because this is a capillary, um, these hairs are going to help to prevent blood cells from sticking to the walls of the capillary as they make their way through. So now let's go back and discuss the HIV thing, because that is very interesting. So, glycoproteins are usually helpful to the cell. Usually cells use glycoproteins as recognition tools. So if a white blood cell bumps into one of your uh, body cells, the glycocalyx of the body cell is the signal to the white blood cell that, oh, hey, this cell belongs here. It's not a foreign invader and we don't have to destroy it. So that's part of how your immune system works. Um, so HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV is the name for the specific virus. Um, and AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, is the pathology that results from the virus. So HIV and AIDS are separate things. So just because somebody is HIV positive does not mean they have AIDS, for example. So um, how does HIV gain access to cells? Cells are usually pretty good at guarding what gets into them. Um, they have robust defense mechanisms, but HIV is able to pass those um, before a cell has time to notice and do anything about it. So how does it do that? Well, there is a receptor on the surface of helper T cells, and helper T cells in particular are kind of T cells that, um, they're a kind of a jack of all trades white blood cell. So they're involved in lots and lots of different parts of the immune system. They don't have just one job. And because of that, when they become disabled, uh, the immune system basically shuts down. So it, all it takes is one part of the immune community of cells to be disabled for really big problems to occur. So what HIV does is there's a little chunk of genetic material in here. And then there's this big complex protein coat around it that kind of functions as the virus's membrane. So viruses aren't cells, they're not alive, uh, but they have similar elements. And one of those things is the protein coat. So for a virus, that's its protective layer. It protects it from the outside world, but it also has elements that allow it to gain access to cells. So the CD4 receptor is a element of the glycocalyx, it's a glycoprotein, and it's ordinarily involved in recognition. So it would bind to things in the human body and recognize them as self or non-self. So it's one of those. Uh, however, HIV has evolved a site, these little C-shaped guys, uh, a site on its protein coat that happens to snugly fit the CD4 receptor very, very easily. So instead of recognition, this allows the HIV uh, virus to get into the helper T cell. So once it docks, a series of reactions take place that allow the viral particle to enter the cytoplasm of the CD4 helper T cell. And then once that happens, uh, the virus gets to work hijacking the endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes to make more copies of itself and to make more copies of its protein coat rather than doing what it would normally do. So that's how it kills the cell and that's how it makes more of itself. So, Alrighty, so we've been through that. 
The glycocalyx provides binding sites for signaling molecules, for example, insulin or other things, and it also helps to lubricate cells, so I gave you that example in that blood vessel, and in some cases stick together. So how can it both lubricate and bind things? Well, uh, different glycocalyx elements do different functions, so it's reductive to say that every cell's glycocalyx looks the same. They absolutely do not. So you could have a cell with a lubricating glycocalyx, like the endothelial cells of small blood vessels, or you could have one that was really, really sticky. It just depends on what the cell needs. Okay, the plasma membrane and the fluid mosaic model. So the fluid mosaic model uh, basically states that the fluid is a phospholipid bilayer, but within that bilayer, so that planar flat surface or layer, the proteins and cholesterols and other things that are embedded in it, they don't have to stay in one place. They can move around within the layer of phospholipids just fine. So they can move laterally across it. So the example I gave was filling a swimming pool with ping pong balls and then tossing some other larger swimming pool related toys in. So if you were to push the ping pong ball down, um, it would float right back up, so it's maintaining a layer, but within that layer, you know, if you want to drag your pizza-shaped floaty over to the under end of the pool, it's just going to push the ping pong balls out of the way, um, so things can flow past each other. That's a pretty apt description of the fluid mosaic model. All right, so we need to talk about diffusion, and I'm going to make a Khan Academy style video about this as well, but Suffice it to say, we have to talk about how things cross membranes because if a cell had a completely impermeable membrane, so nothing could cross at all, the cell would die. It would not be able to acquire things from the environment that it needs, and it would also not be able to release wastes when it needed to. So you'd have a cell that was both starving and suffering from a buildup of waste in its internal surfaces and organelles, and that doesn't do anybody any good. So we have to discuss how cells permit things across. And we're gonna start with a very rudimentary process and then work up to more complex ones by the end of this presentation. So here we have our bilayer and we know about it that large polar things can't cross and small hydrophobic things can. So this is simple diffusion, simple. So simple means basically no frills, no bells and whistles does not use proteins, doesn't use protein channels, and also doesn't use ATP. So simple diffusion happens just by virtue of thermodynamics, not because the cell is trying to do something. So Simple diffusion follows a concentration gradient. So a gradient is where there's more of something somewhere and less of something somewhere else. And I know that's a confusing sentence to hear, so let me draw it out for you down here. So I'm gonna make a lot of orange dots. Oh, so many orange dots. All right, so here I've made a gradient. Over on the left side, there is a high concentration of orange dots. And over here, there are still orange dots. There's just a very low concentration of them. And the gradient is the fact that all throughout this streak that I've just made, there are orange dots. It's just that there's more down here and they gradually decrease as you move right. So that's a gradient, right? So in this picture up here, we have a bunch of blue hexagons and they are going to start crossing this membrane. So now we have a gradient where there's a high concentration here and a low concentration here. So the rule for all particles as they diffuse is that particles want to travel from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, if they can, if they're not blocked by a bilayer, for example. So in this case we can see that at time two, so this is just time going forward, time passing, so we can call this time zero, time one, and time two. At time one, the hexagons have begun to cross our membrane. 
Um, they haven't done so fully yet, but they're in the process. So now our gradient is a little bit less steep. Uh, if you were to subtract uh, side with none from side with lots, here you would get a very large number and here you would get a smaller number. So as this proceeds, it will keep going until there's about the same number of hexagons on each side. So as you can see here in time number two, there's about an equal amount of hexagons on either side. So this we call equilibrium. So at equilibrium, there is no more net movement of particles in one direction or another, or another but rather there is particles moving this way just as often as they are moving this way so that there is no net difference between the two sides of the membrane. So that's the idea there. So simple diffusion is things crossing a membrane down their concentration gradient, so from high to low, without using protein channels and without spending any ATP. All right, osmosis is a little bit trickier to understand. So the deal with osmosis, and I'm gonna change colors here, I like this purpley one. So osmosis is the diffusion of water only. So it follows the same principle as diffusion, but we use osmosis to talk about the diffusion of water only. So you'd never say that salt was doing osmosis. That's not how that works. So diffusion of water. So if I have a semi-permeable membrane in a beaker and I tell you that my beaker membrane is only permeable to water, that means that even though there's lots of purple dots on this side and fewer on this side, the purple dots can't cross because this membrane is only permeable to water. So if wa it is permeable to water, notice how on this side, on the left, there's a lot of water. On this side, there's less water that you can see because there's more solutes dissolved in it. So water always moves from an area of a higher concentration of water to one of a lower concentration of water. So if there is a high water concentration here and a low water concentration here, water is going to move this way. And the result is you see a volume change. So water is going to move to the side with more purple dots until there's about an even distribution of purple dots to water. So you can see here, not very concentrated with purple dots. Here, very concentrated with purple dots. And then this other beaker, after time has passed, now they have about an equal concentration of purple dots there. So another way to think about diffusion of water or osmosis that's a little bit easier to wrap your brain around because it's not necessarily intuitive right off the bat is just keep this in your back pocket. Water follows solutes. So remember in a solution, a solute is the thing being dissolved. So in this case, the solute would be the purple dots. Um, and basically the rule for osmosis is that if water can cross a membrane to get to the side of the membrane where there's more solutes, it will. So here we see the left side of the membrane has more solutes and water is saying, oh man, solute party over there, let's go over there. So that's another way to think about it that's a little bit more intuitive for some folks. Okay, tonicity. So tonicity is hard for students to understand as well. Um, and I'm going to change colors here. So tonicity refers only to the solution that cells are surrounded by. So it's a way to describe the tendency of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. So use only for solutions, not for cells. So you would never say a cell was isotonic or hypotonic or hypertonic. Never ever do that. It's not accurate. Rather, tonicity is used to describe the water and whatever solutes are in it that surround a cell. So let's think about our rules of osmosis here. If a solution is hypertonic, that means it has more solutes than the cell. So relative to the cytosol of the cell, 
the solution has a higher concentration of solutes. If it's too high, then there will be a bulk movement of water out of the cell, because think about our rules of osmosis here, water wants to be where the solutes are at. So if there's more solutes outside of a cell, water is going to leave a cell and enter the solution. And that causes a phenomenon called crenation, which is just a fancy science way to say shriveling up. So you can see these red blood cells are very unhappy. They're squiggly and squished and shriveled. Those are crenated red blood cells. Isotonic means that a solution has the same or about the same solute concentration as the cytosol. And it's not that water's not crossing the membrane here, it's just that it's entering the cell at the same rate that it's leaving the cell, so that there's no net movement of water. So no net change. Hypotonic solutions, so hypo meaning below, these have fewer solutes. And because they have fewer solutes than the cell, water from the solution is going to enter the cell because that's where the solute party is at. So more solutes inside the cell means water is going to want to rush into the cell, hang out with the solute party. And in some cases, uh, the water can fill the cell so much that the structural integrity of the membrane is compromised and the cell will burst. So hypotonic solutions are just as bad as hypertonic, but for a different reason. So the take-home message here is that cells really fare best in an isotonic environment. That's where they want to be. Um, so when you do something to the extracellular fluid that makes it hyper or hypotonic, cells don't do as well physiologically, and sometimes they even die. All right, Targer pressure is the same concept, but in plant cells. And the reason we're emphasizing it is that uh, unlike animal cells, plant cells have a cell wall. So under hypotonic conditions, where the fluid surrounding the cell is less concentrated with solutes than the cell, in a plant cell, the water will move in and the vacuole will fill up with water. And instead of bursting, the cell is just going to push harder on the cell wall. And that creates a nice stiff plant. So you know when you put a carrot in the fridge and then you forget about it and you come back later when you're cleaning your fridge and you have a bendy carrot? The reason that the carrot is bendy is because it's lost water, but there are still cell walls and there are still cells within them. And that just means that if you stick the carrot back in water, water will move back into the cells and plump them up again. So you can actually revive bendy carrots as long as they're not too far gone. Um, in an isotonic condition, the entry of water into the cell and into the uh, vacuole is going to equal the amount of water leaving. And in a hypertonic situation, you're going to experience plasmolysis where there's bulk movement of water out of the cell and out of the vacuole. Um, so the tonicity of the solution that the cell is bathed in really causes these kinds of movements, but because there is a cell wall around it, it looks a little bit different than it does in an animal cell. Okay, so now let's talk about facilitated diffusion. So what you're seeing here are two sides of a membrane, so I want you to note and keep track of your vocabulary. Extracellular means outside of cell. And this is the cytoplasm, so we can just summarize this by saying this is in, this is out. Okay, so what you can see here are two concentration gradients. So I'm going to make the potassium gradient be purple like potassium. So if potassium could cross the cell membrane, it would like to go this way because this is high potassium. And over here, we have lots and lots of sodium. So this is high sodium, and if the sodium could cross the membrane, it would like to go this way because here we have high sodium. But remember, things that are polar or charged can't cross the membrane without assistance. So because there's this plus here and this plus here, these two ions cannot, uh -uh, uh -uh, cannot cross the membrane without going through a channel. So they cannot slip between those fatty acid tails in the bilayer. Fortunately for potassium, it has a channel available to it. So facilitated diffusion is 
Diffusion, again, no ATP is spent. And particles flowed down their concentration gradients. So from high to low. They just do so through a helper protein in the form of a channel. So this protein is going to be large. It's going to form a tube. Uh, another th important thing to note is that it's going to be specific to the ion it's moving. So most channels are not one size fits all. They can't admit lots and lots of different kinds of things across, but rather they are specific to the one thing that they are allowed to move. So this we would call a potassium channel. All right. So that is facilitated diffusion. Still no ATP spent, still down a concentration gradient, but this time with the assistance of a protein. All right, so now we're going to talk about active transport. And this is different from what we've been talking about because in facilitated and in simple diffusion, you have particles flowing down their concentration gradients, so from high to low. Active transport is the opposite, so movement of particles from a low concentration to a high concentration. Oops, why did I write loy? That doesn't make any sense. Haha, <laughs> low concentration to high. So this isn't the way that particles want to move naturally uh, under the laws of thermodynamics. They will always want to go from high to low. So if you want to move things against or up their concentration gradient, you have to use ATP. So similar to if I uh, want a boulder to be at the top of a hill, boulders tend to roll down hills and stay them. So if I want to move a boulder to the top of a hill, I'm going to have to invest a bunch of personal energy in the form of me rolling that sucker up there. So it's going to be heavy, it's going to cost a lot of calories on my part, but once I do it, it'll be there and then I'll just leave my boulder there propped up. So that's an example um, that's sort of analogous to active transport. I'm moving something to a thermodynamically unfavorable place and then I'm spending a bunch of energy to get it there. So here's the sodium potassium pump. So what you're seeing here is there's more sodium out here and there's more potassium in here. And this is actually true for most cells, specifically your muscle and nerve cells, which you'll learn about if you take A and P. Um, so we have this channel protein, but notice it's not a straight tube and it's not just letting things flow down their concentration gradients. It has binding sites on the inside. So in state one, this protein channel is going to remain open until one, two, three sodiums have bound to the inside. Once that happens, it's going to flip its configuration and bind and cleave an ATP. So here's an ATP. This is a phosphate group. This is a phosphate group. This is a phosphate group. Um, and then it cleaves one, which releases energy. So that's the point of ATP. When you break one of these little phosphate bonds, it releases a little packet of energy that can be used to do work. And in that case, the work is spitting this sodium out on the other side where there's already a lot of sodium. So once that happens, now this covalent bond is broken. So we have ADP and it's going to go away. And then meanwhile, potassium is binding to the binding site here. That triggers the protein to simultaneously release the phosphate that it's holding on to and also flip configurations to dump the potassium in here where there's already a lot of potassium. So this particular channel, the sodium potassium pump, is ubiquitous in your body. So the word ubiquitous means very, very common. So you see a lot of them. Uh, to give an example, to bolster that definition for you guys, uh, pigeons are ubiquitous. You see them everywhere. They are super numerous and all over the place. So same deal with sodium potassium channels in the body. They're in your kidney cells. They're in your intestines. They're in your neurons. They're in your muscles. They have a big job. Um, and in fact, about 6% of your daily calorie budget that you from food you eat goes to making enough ATP to power 
the sodium potassium pumps in your kidneys only, not even the rest of them. So they're very important. And they all do active transport, which again, before we move on, moves particles up or against their concentration gradients and costs energy to do so. All right. So we've so far been just talking about things crossing membranes by just going across. So doing stuff like this or like this. But now we need to talk about some ways that cells move things when they want to use the membrane in a different way. So there are three kinds of endocytosis and endo means inside or within. So what we're looking at here are ways that cells are going to take things into themselves. And type number one is phagocytosis, or some people say phagocytosis. It's kind of a style choice. In phagocytosis, what happens is the cell membrane is going to extrude to form some little lips. So if you were to like flip this vertical, it would kind of look like a little guy with a nose. Let's make this yellow. eating a particle, in this case, one that looks like a bean. So the cell is going to extrude little lips. These are actually called pseudopods, which means pretend foot. So it's an extension of the cell membrane. And it's going to wrap these around this little particle until the two edges meet. And once it's done that, it will have formed a vesicle. Um, so in some literature, they call it a vacuole because it's large and has lots of water in it, but it's really more appropriate to call it a vesicle because a vacuole has specific functions within a plant, and animal cells lack vacuoles, but they definitely do this process. So this is a little bit of a misnomer. Call it a vesicle. So that's for things like white blood cells engulfing bacteria, blah, 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 blah. Pinocytosis is kind of like the cell taking a little sip of its environment. So we call it cell drinking. So phagocytosis, um, phagy is to eat. So this is cell eating. And pinocytosis is cell drinking. So in pinocytosis, the cell has detected that there are solutes dissolved in the extracellular fluid nearby it that it would like to eat. Um, so it's going to just take a little sip of its environment by just invaginating the membrane. So instead of extruding a mouth, it's going to just take a little sip of its environment. So let's say this cell is like, ooh, squares. I like squares. I'm just going to take a sip of this delicious square water. So it invaginates its membrane, closes it off, and now we have a vesicle containing a square. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is the final kind, and this one, um, the cell is trying to gather items from the environment, but it's also trying to minimize the amount of water it takes in while doing so. So both uh, pinocytosis and phagocytosis involve the intake of a lot of water, as well as whatever the object of interest is. Um, cells have to closely manage how much water they have inside of them, because if they take too much extracellular fluid in, um, their volume changes and they risk changing their concentration relative to the solution, which as we know from tonicity can change the way water moves. So the cells have to be kind of careful about that. So receptor mediated endocytosis uses receptors, which are membrane bound proteins that bind to a specific thing. So in this case, that thing is stars. So this cell is saying, I would like these delicious stars, but I don't really want the water that they're dissolved in as much. I just want the stars. So it's going to wait until three stars have bound. And that's going to trigger the invagination of this clathrin coated. Clathrin is a protein. Clathrin coated vesicle. So the cell membrane is going to invaginate and form this clathrin coated vesicle that now contains stars. And then the clathrin on the outside is going to direct uh, where the vesicle goes to drop the stars off. So that's the idea there. So that's endocytosis, but that's not the only way that cells move things. So let's go look at exocytosis, shall we? And trash all that. So sometimes cells need to move things out in bulk as well. So it's not efficient enough for things to just cross the membrane via diffusion or active transport. The cell kind of wants to blorp out, and I'm scientific term, blorp, kind of wants to blorp out some substance in a group. So in exocytosis, a vesicle 
migrates to the edge of the membrane, and then because they're made of the same stuff, they can just fuse together. And now what was on the inside is now on the outside. So first of all, let's make sure that we are always checking back in with our cell knowledge. So take a moment to think about where that vesicle came from and where the stuff inside of it probably came from. So I'm just going to give you a second. All right, so if you said, well, I know that the Golgi apparatus packages things and, tra and transports uh, vesicles and creates vesicles, then you're right. So this vesicle probably came from the Golgi apparatus. And the green dots inside of it are likely to be proteins that were made by the endoplasmic reticulum. Not a guarantee, not definitely, but probably. So exo means outside. So exocytosis is the way that a cell uses its membrane in this manner to kick things out of a cell rather than let them in. All right, I'm back. Sorry, I had to pause because I had to take something away from Tiki that she wasn't supposed to have. And now she is eating a piece of bread the size of her entire torso. So she's very happy at the moment. Wish you guys could see her. Alrighty, so moving right along, let's go do this and then go to the next slide. That is it. So uh, we're finished with chapter three at this point. Here's a dancing kitten. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and post this and then put it on Slack for y'all and then get started on the chapter four video. Uh, I wasn't able to post those today because I was having a difficult time with the software I used to make these screen caps. I needed to update it. So um, that'll be up soon and should aid you with studying for the upcoming exam. All right. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Have a